Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Unlaced Podcast. Uh, we've been really enjoying the last few episodes, all the subscribers out there. Can't thank you enough for all your input and support. Uh, today's a very special one, as, as we've spoken of in the past, very passionate about female sport uh, and where female sport is going, particularly AFLW is one, one area obviously more notable from a national uh, perspective that's getting some real limelight and has just finished out the season. So timely enough, we've got one of the, I guess, the business moguls of the female sporting world in Alexandra Saundry. Uh, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Jake. It'll be, you know, a bit of fun today. So yeah. Again. No, pleasure, pleasure. Now, you've got a pretty unique story, which we are going to go into of, of how you are, I guess, played in the initial AFLW when it started and made a move into, uh, I guess, female sports management company and, and, and the management side of the game, which is always a fascinating um, I guess, angle on sport that, that I don't really know enough about of. Obviously, I wasn't really a manager myself. But I do want to get to this season that's just gone by. I mean, what do you, you make of it? Oh, I just think we're seeing the, the competition go from strength to strength every year. And it's really exciting to see these youngsters come through and really have an impact straight away at the competition. But even the likes on the weekend of Isabella Dawes, we've got, um, we've got Courtney Hodder and girls like that that are just coming in and making immediate impacts for the Brisbane crazy. Lions. And yeah. it's crazy. And girls coming from other sports who probably haven't been given the opportunity to be on the big stage like yeah. AFLW. And I think it's just really cool to see different people's stories and their backgrounds and how they've evolved to become a part of this, you know, amazing competition. Did you, did you ever think going from, obviously we're going to when you were drafted into or sort of became part of the, the GWS Giants in season one, but did you ever think it would get to this point of like having 25,000 people at Adelaide over a grand final, like the way it was? Oh, I, I don't think so. Um, yeah. particularly round one, the, the lockout game was, you know, a bigger shock enough. So yeah. after that, I think there was a, you know, a shift in probably my mentality around, well, we're really here and we're here to, you know, do something special. Um, and whatever capacity anyone brought to that, it was really great to see like Adelaide Oval last time they played a grand final there, the numbers, I think it was 32,000 yeah, last time. Massive. And massive. So the numbers, again, it's just sensational to see the, the continuation of that, even though the tickets are paid for now. Yeah, so yeah. There's, I think the argument's gone away from people just go because it's free. So I think that's really cool. And it was such a good advertisement of the female game as well, the grand final. Like it was an electric game. I mean, Brisbane Lions were, were phenomenal. And, and you mentioned her name, Courtney Hodder, before. Like some of the goals she was kicking was just out of this where Eddie Betts like. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Very so, exciting. So super, so many super talented females and they was finally, I guess, getting some of the limelight that they deserve. And it was a massive win for, for the um, Brisbane Lions. Obviously Adelaide Crows have been immense since the inception of the league. Um, I guess we touched on the development of from season one to, to now from, I guess, crowd perspective, but just from the actual brand of football, I mean, you seeing sort of the skill sets of the girls and the actual quality of players coming through just, you know, advance even more? I think it's just booming, Jake. Yeah. Like it's in terms of when you, when you look at the contractor players at the moment, um, a normal, a normal way to contract players would their peak of the career is probably about 20, you know, seven, 28 ish mm. in the men's and girls are coming in now at the age of 19 or 20 and probably being some of the highest paid players on the list because wow. they are the best talent. Yeah. So clubs are needing to retain that talent for longer periods of time. So I think the evolution of that's going to be really interesting across the next three to five years, um, particularly the likes of Madison Press Parkers, who takes out a league B and F at 19 years of age. It's just Machine. crazy. Yeah. And her sister is coming in this year for this year's draft, Georgie Press Parkers. And, you know, she was winning league best and fairest two years ago when that's she's, crazy. you know, 16 years old. So it's it's just baffling to see the the impact um, these girls are having. But they're having an impact because their skill set's so much higher. So yeah. just, they look like they've got more time. but. In reality, they're just more coordinated, yeah. potentially, and they can kick on both sides of their foot, so they're just more eloquent in the way they go about it. Yeah, that's true. Well, I don't know if that was a slight stab at you and I, because <laughs> we, technically we should be in the peak of our powers now, but we, we don't play it anymore. So, um, no, but that, it is, I mean, some of the youngsters, you mentioned some of Madison Press Packers, I'm, I'm a Saints fan, so I'm a massive fan of Georgia Patrikios. I mean, she's a superstar. She probably should win the best and fairest as well, but... Um, just going from when you played in the in inaugural AFLW season, I mean, what was that like? I guess it would have been foreign territory for, for female sport in this country, particularly AFL. Um, can you give us a bit of background of what that time was like for you? I felt just really grateful to be there, to be honest. Um, and I think that mentality is really shifted now and it's, I'm happy it's shifted. But at that point in time, I was just fortunate to get a spot on the list when I was, um, 18 years old coming out of sport, I'd kind of quit. I'd thought that was it. There was no pathway and 
when the whisper of AFRW came around, I started to apply myself a bit more and I was just grateful to be given the opportunity with the Giants. Great club, great family club, great community and to be invested in such a great program that was still growing as well um, and football's growing in Sydney and, and, and New South Wales. So it was really cool. But um, the feeling of when you, like I ran out against Adelaide in the first round of the first season, it was just like, yeah, how cool is it to be here? Like, yeah. and it was a bit surreal, to be honest. Um, and that's probably, like, I, I remember, you know, I was playing on the likes of Erin Phillips. And at the point in time, nobody really knew who Erin Phillips was. And, and now she's an absolute household name and, yeah. you know, multiple best and fairest winner and, and the like. But it's, you know, baffling to think you're on those plays, not <laughs> yeah. knowing who they were. Yeah. And you, you really embarrass yourself being on those plays. But I was just grateful to be part of it. Um, and I didn't play the second season due to injury, but you know, I had probably enjoyed my time a lot more in the second season because you felt part of something. Yeah. And I think that's why footy and, and team sports so infectious because the yeah. camaraderie and the, the, the belonging you get from a big team sport is, is incredible. No, I agree. I agree. Ed, you grew up in Victoria, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So, yep. I mean, pr particularly with me when I was playing sport, because I always I think up until like 13, uh, there was probably always a girl on my team playing like with, with the boys and they'd always be as good, if not better. But it always seemed like from, from a female point of view, it would get to a sort of a certain point and there was really no pathway to really go beyond, um, obviously to play at a professional standpoint. So obviously the interest might have fizzled out for some girls, particularly in the contact sports like AFL, where there wasn't those professional leagues. I mean, did you ever see this being possible as a, as a girl in Victoria that probably played footy, like it's obviously so phenomenal now for the younger girls that they can actually shoot for the stars with something because there's a foundation for them to go after. Yeah, absolutely. I played under 12s at St. Bernard's Football Club <laughs> and that's just where dad went to school. So I went and played because yeah. my younger brother didn't play and I was like, oh, I may as well go give it a crack and see if dad will come watch me on the weekends. Yeah. And Played under 12s and couldn't play again and didn't actually go play the next year because the boys were just so much bigger and um, yeah. it was kind of scary. So I kind of gave that up but then moved into um, – another footy program under 18s at the St Kilda Sharks and then to Melbourne Uni. And, and there was amazing programs back then. Charlotte Curtis, who, you know, was the head of the female football development at AFL Victoria. She was having academies with the, you know, Essendon Footy Club branding. And, you know, you were part of something and mm. it's not only just local footy, but there was pathways outside. And I think that's what I loved about it. But it did get to a point where the women's league, when I was ready to kind of graduate from youth girls that gave me a lot of a sense of, you know, development and understanding how to get better. You went into the women's league and that wasn't the case. So yeah. I just didn't like it because I, I played sport to get better and I played sport to, you know, go to a common goal. But back then girls just played to bash and hit people and, you know, yeah, bash right. and crash football. And I just didn't like that. I liked the skill, the finesse and the learnings around that. So, um, I guess it was the evolution of being like, you know, one of the, one of the younger kids playing, but I, I loved my time in under 18s and, mm. but you know, from 12 to about 14 to 15, you, I lost a lot of that football in then. Like I played tennis, I played water polo. I did every sport under the sun at school. I rode for, you know, a long period of time, but, um, yeah, it was just the, you know, the huge gap, but also, you know, strength and conditioning, you'd play footy on the weekend, but <laughs> I'd never touched an Olympic barbell. I'd never touched, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'd never done a running program until I got to the giants at age 24, I think I was. So it was the big gap in terms of like Madison Press Parker. She's getting programs yeah. since she was 15 to, to 20. So it's like, it's pretty, yeah, it's a big difference. It's almost like now the sun and imagine the next five years, the girls coming through that are, are doing these, you know, these things from, from such a younger age. It's, it's completely true. I mean, what's interesting with you, so you got, you were injured in your second season at the Giants. Yeah. So I came, um, I was actually the fittest and strongest I'd ever been as <laughs> playing. And I think I'm, I'm notoriously an over trainer. So I was right. like wanting to do everything and everything right. And, um, I kind of got to two weeks before uh, the week of the practice match, which was two weeks before round one. And I wasn't moving well at training and the physios, physios were like, what's going on with you? And I said, nothing, nothing's wrong. Just leave me alone. You know, like, just let me play. Like, just leave me alone. And they're like, nah, something's not right with your leg. You're not running properly. And I was like, I'm fine. Just leave me alone. Like I was always like that. And, um, I just wanted to put my head down and do the work and then, and then get off the track. Yeah. But they were like, nah, you're off the track. Come on, come in. And, and then, um, they were feeling my leg and I couldn't, I had really like bad pain through my tibia, I think it was in my leg. And so they sent me off for scans the next day and I had really bad bone stress and, and whatnot through my legs. So they were like, well, you're going to be five weeks off legs and then you'll be loaded into a three to four week running program. And back then that's the end of the season. And Jeez. you're kind of like, cool. I've just moved my life. I've, you know, made work, keep me on full time up in Sydney and paying ridiculous rent in Sydney mm. for a stupid contract, you know, yeah. that is like $13,000 back then. You're like, 
God, I'm just a year, another year back now. So yeah. um, for me, I think the writing was on the wall when it, the season got you know closer to the end that I did have to give it up if I wanted to pursue the career that I wanted. Yeah. Um, I had a really great boss at the time that let me go and do it. But, you know, if the whole office is in Melbourne and I'm the only one in Sydney, you know, that does strain the relationship of work a lot. So yeah. it was, I was always, always very work focused and having footy, I think gave me a lot of perspective and a lot of learnings as an individual, but definitely I couldn't grow in the other aspect of my life that I wanted to grow in. Do you reckon that's a common challenge? I mean, I don't know from where the game's from there, but obviously it's progressed a lot, but do, do females within the AFLW still have some of those challenges? Obviously balancing, trying to be the best at AFLW, but probably not having the financial stability to, to be fully, um, I guess, I guess, giving themselves to that sport because there's obviously a short, it's shorter seasons and they've obviously got to work outside of it for some of them too. So, yeah, I just think it's, it's baffling that the competition is probably still at this point in terms of girls that, that the contract rate they're on. There's some girls that are really fortunate to be paid really good money, mm. um, for it, um, for what, for how many games they play, but we've got girls that, you know, are studying to be lawyers, doctors, and you know, if you want to be a lawyer and you can't, you, you can't. can't, it's not physically possible. Like yeah. I've got friends that are lawyers and they're at work till 9 p.m. 10 p.m. every single night. It's like, that's, you can't even play local footy if you're doing those yeah, kind correct. of jobs and like, um, being a doctor or anything like that. So I think it's really challenging, but you know, te like the teachers even find it hard. They've got, you know, they finish at three 30 and they might be able to get to training, but they've still got to get up really early or the tradies that have got to be, correct. you know, up at five 30 every morning or girls that are traveling an hour and a half, two hours to work every day. It's just not conjunctive to where that they want to take the competition right now. And you know, I'm really lucky to manage some really amazing players that are, and people that are trying to make a difference in that space. But right now the competition is in a bit of a, oh, it's a, it's in a really weird spot where you either go more full time and the yeah. girls jeopardize their careers more, or how do you find that balance? And I think that's a huge part of my role with those girls in, in terms of helping them find that balance. And it's, it's important for them, particularly life after sport, like we spoke about before that yeah. they need to have something that they're striving towards, even Definitely. if they're ticking it off, you know inches at a time it's it's something they need to have outside of that they're not fortunate like the boys to you know have full-time contracts and security and what they're doing we don't even know when the competition's going to start yeah. this year yeah, like right. and when pre-season's going to start so if, if that we don't know when sign and trade is we and there's all these things that are up in the air that continuously get pushed back and it directly impacts the girls jobs life outside and employment but not a, not only that it's the girls that don't know if they're going to get a contract the yeah. anxiety is huge yeah how how do you balance like being a manager for the AFL player that you obviously want them to succeed on the field and do as much as they can but then also the realization that some of these girls actually have to have you know other support mechanisms in in place you know whether that's study or or work to keep themselves going because obviously the the women's games at a certain point right now where they can't go all in how do you balance that it's, from your perspective? I think you balance it in the best way possible in terms of like probably putting the money aspect into really black and white. If they want to earn as much as they can in football, well, they're going to have to also invest money into their careers outside of that in the, the six month time that they're not at the club. So they have to earn some additional money compared to their football contract. Mm. So you try to sell it in a way that they need to educate themselves, but they also need to go towards something and that might be a part-time job at rebel sport or, yeah, yeah. you know, a different job at a cafe. It's just something, but I'm a big advocate for that because it actually distracts them from the football world yeah, definitely. and it takes their mind off it and yeah. it gives them perspective of what life is as well and yeah. not getting caught up in a part-time job that is football at the moment that girls think it is full-time and it's, you know, you're not getting paid full-time to do it. I, I love the passion and I love the enthusiasm and I love the drive to get better, but the actual crux of it, it's, it's not paying you enough to actually have a life that you can move out of home, save for a house or, you know, save to just have, do, do life normally. Yeah. So I think the strain of that, you try to put it in perspective and like I do a lot of goal setting with my clients and how we can set goals off the field, but on the field and actually to, um, separate them, not make them one goal setting exercise where your life all, all of a sudden becomes football. Football is a part of you. It's not your whole life. And demonstrating that to some of the girls coming through is challenging, mm. um, but I think, you know, we're in great stead to, to be able to help the girls and educate the girls in a way that it is just part of them. It doesn't define them and it doesn't define who they are, but you want them to have the drive to get better. Because at the end of the day, if they're going to get better, they're going to get a better contract and, and then they're going to be happy. And that's what the, it drives it at the end of the day. They need to enjoy what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there, um, without obviously going into the depth of financials of anyone, but is there, is there players that are, can, can sort of see them like 
I guess their contracts reflect a full time sort of operation and player that they can do, and then there's some that don't. Is there still a sort of imbalance, or is yeah, it absolutely. I think okay. there's some. You know, there's a handful of players within the comp that could com- comfortably sit back and wow. and play the uh, the nine games and and be completely paid full time, really good full time wage. But then there's some that you know, yeah, are probably the hardest workers, and they don't actually get paid or remunerated anywhere near it. I've got one girl that. Um, you know, did her knee last year and, and she was the first one going, Alex, how do, like, who can, who can I get to, you know, I'll pay them. How do I get my knee better? I want to play round one next year. And, you know, she's putting thousands of dollars away each month to just get a person that's actually going to be there for her to do the training oh. with her and through her ACR re- rehabilitation. And it's kind of like, to me, she played round one, she was traded, she played round one and she, it, her story was for me, I was like, that's, you know, that's amazing to see an athlete with so much drive that. They're not going, oh, I only get paid 15 grand. I've, you know, I've got to invest three grand into that. That's a huge chunk of that. They're thinking, I play footy because I love it and I want to get back out there. And, you know, that's who, that they're the people you want to manage because if it doesn't have too much driving on the money side of things, when, you know, the money doesn't come, it's not going to be as detrimental to them. They deserve to get paid as much as we can. And, and as a manager, you want yeah, them to get course. paid as much as you can for as long as you can. But you also want them to have perspective on why they play yeah. as well. Yeah. So for, for you working with the, the range of your athletes, do most of them work as well? I mean, are, are most of them working or studying yeah, to, to balance? I mean, um, all? I'd say all of them have at least got a job. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, Even if crazy. it's at the club or, or whatnot, I would say every single player has a job. Yeah. Do you see the sort of, I mean, do you, do you see the sort of in the future, the near future, us being able to close that gap from, I guess, the highest paid to the lowest paid and, and making that more consistent across the league to reflect, obviously, the talent we're seeing is, is just phenomenal. Yeah. I, well, I hope so. I hope it gets to a point where um, we are able to not have a tiering system with AFLW and mm. the girls get remunerated accordingly, accordingly, similar to W League. Like a lot of clubs just go, well, we'll pay you base wage and that's it. And the girls go, well, I'm not going to get much more if I move to another club. And that means uprooting my life. Like how do I yeah. justify, you know, being one of the best players in the team, being on young Matilda's list and being paid base payment? Yeah, like it's ridiculous. it just doesn't make sense. And I think the FFA are doing everything they can and the PFA to do that, but it's similar to where AFLW is at the moment. It's kind of going, we need to see some change or just some plans. It doesn't need to happen right right now, but can we just have some understanding of what's ahead instead of every year going, well, it costs us $1.5 million each round. Yeah. Well, great. It does cost you that. So how are you going to help sustain that? And where are you going to make different inroads to actually help the girls increase their contract value because they'll, they'll do the work. The yeah. girls will do the work. We know that, um, this, like a season like Darcy Vestio has had, you know, she invests a lot of time and money into her performance over the past 12 months. And she's, you know, reaped the rewards of that all Australian nomination leading goal kicker. Yeah, she like she's having a great a season. Yeah. She's a, she's a no injuries through the preseason and, and whatnot. So I think, I think we'll get there, but it's going to take, unless the AFL can give the girls some sort of plan. Yeah. Um, and probably the PFA to that degree, th- th- you're going to lose girls. You're yeah. going to lose girls to the competition, um, which is will be disappointing. Yeah, I think so too, because it's almost like at least you, you get visibility of the investment and the time and effort you're giving is going to pay off, if not for you, for, for the girls down the line. Whereas if there's sort of that grayness, it's like, well, I've got, at some point you're going to make a decision. Is this is this nine weeks sort of contract and payment serving me for what I could be doing elsewhere? And you're right, that, that could be a, a decision some girls would have to make. And I'm sure like yourself, you had to make when you were sort of transitioning out of GWS, which kind of leads me to my next question um, around, I guess, your move into management, because I know you obviously have your own female sports management company now, um, but you did work with Paul Connors and, and sort of that Connors Sports in a, in a management capacity there too. So can you explain to us how you ended up in this world? Yeah, I guess it's a bit of a, I'm a bit of a stickler for a plan. So when <laughs> I left school, I knew what I wanted to do and I knew where I wanted to be and I wanted to get an internship with Paul Connors. Um, so I what, what made you, what was the, what, like, he was just the one in the media all the time that looked like he was the mover and shaker of the industry. Oh, and gold. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And I just think he had a small business as well. It wasn't a really, you know, when you looked at it, it wasn't some commercial big, do- like, you know, really commercial big dog that would have sacrificed his player's career to make a buck. And mm. I think that's where I really resonated with Paul. He really genuinely cared about the players. Mm. And I just remember over those five years from when I, left school to getting the job. I did everything I could. I went and worked in what is now the NAB league. I went and worked at the call to cannons, um, you know, sat under Marty Allison, who was the head coach of the under 18s men's at the time and, and just understood the pathways and understood what it took to do, you know, player management. I worked in an accounting firm 
with a base wage. I think it was 11 or $12, you know, per hour. And I did that one day a week because I knew it was going to hold me in good stead to have office experience and et cetera, et cetera. So there was things I did along the way that maybe, you know, I didn't have the savings I wanted to after five years, but I, I got the job mm. after five years and I walked into, um, I sent Paul an email and, um, his wife, Kirsty, and I just said, look, I'd love to have the opportunity to do an internship with you guys. And they went, yeah, no worries. Come in for an interview. We'll see what we, what we, wow. you know, what, what it's like. And I sat there and they're like, Paul's like, oh yeah, love your resume and ticked. And he's notorious for getting his pen out and scribbling over everything. So he's like, yeah, tick, 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 all good. And I was like, okay, yeah, like erratic. <laughs> and I was just like sitting there and he goes, oh, the internship, no worries, Al. That's all good. And, but if you impress us enough, there's a job at the end. And I was like, what? And I was a bit like, okay, sure. No worries. And yeah, one thing led to another, another, and I finished the internship and went part time. Um, cause I was coordinating the rowing program at where I went to school and um, how, old, how old are you at this point? Oh, I think I was 22. Okay. So, so 20. when you, so pretty much when you came out of high school. 21. I was 21. I was 21. 21. Okay. Yeah. I was 21. I was at university, university and then I knew yeah. the, the last year in my degree, I needed to an internship and I wanted to align that with Paul. Okay. And then I wanted to hopefully transition out to a job, which not everyone gets a Cinderella story, but I did. So, wow. so I was really lucky. So when, when you were sort of that, like you, you identified Paul Collins as somebody, you always had wanted to be in this sports management space. Like yeah, that since was year some, 12. Yeah. Wow. What yeah. prompted that? Just like. I love sport. Yeah. I love people. I love creating relationships and I loved, you know, I'd, or notoriously probably always loved Nike and wanted to work at Nike and the commercial right. endorsements and what it took for that. So I kind of combined them all and said, oh, this would be a really cool job. And I kind of went, sweet, let's just go for that. And I loved, but one of my strengths, I think, was, you know, connecting with people and networking with people. And I just had a genuine care and sense for people. And that's, you know, something that I've wanted to take into my business as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess doing that, you know, I landed the job with Paul and um, I was really lucky to get that job, to be honest. Like he had so many people come through for internships and work experience and stuff that, um, you know, the school helped where I went, but you know, it was the experience that I had with, you know, the head coach of the NAB league yeah. at the time I had him as my reference and I had other referees that, you okay. know, he was like, how did, wh how did you get in a program like that? And <laughs> yeah. why are you doing that? Like you're in an accounting firm and he had a background in finance and accounting, which I knew was part okay. of the reason I went and got the part-time job. Wow. So it was kind of all lined up and, and, yeah, you know, thought out. Yeah. Right? It's calculated, better word. So, yeah. um, yeah, it was calculated and I, you know, I had to do it to get the job because I knew how competitive it was and it's even more competitive now. I can imagine. That actually makes you quite even more unique to me because typically, and I'm obviously not in this space, so I could be wrong, but my experiences with people in sports management, they typically go into it after they're playing sort of a career or they've gone through sport in some way, whereas you're before that sort of sporting aspect, you've gone, no, that's what I want to do. It's, it's usually the other way around. It's when you come out of sport, when you've gone through like, I, I understand how this works. I can add something to this and usually people go into it after their career. Whereas that's I why mean, I find that unique. Yeah. Yeah, you're well, like, no, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Well, I've always <laughs> wanted to do it and I always loved it. And I think there was a part of me that knew being a player would help in that capacity too and having a connection with a footy club. <clears> so, um, that was an, another reason why I wanted to play because I wanted the experience as an athlete and what it took. Um, obviously on a different scale to the boys, but, um, I guess having that that experience now holds me in great stead for what I do right now. And, you know, a lot of parents love that I've had experience within the game. I've moved into state. I've moved out of home. Yeah. I've yeah. played on a base wage. I've had the injuries I've done. I've gone through what. You're relatable to yeah, everyone. Right? Exactly. So yeah. there's an aspect of that that's relatable. And, and, you know, I had a great education and I loved my education, but it was the experience that I went out and outside of university that really held me in good stead, use my network and, and did all of that. But yeah, I think I, you know, loved what I did at my time at Connors. And, you know, when I got back and, you know, wanted to retire from footy and, and kind of hung the boots up there, I, I knew that I wanted to, to leave and, and have my own business. And Paul was great in that. I kind of sat down and said, I'm not resigning because you can <laughs> activate my non-compete, but yeah. <laughs> it is my intention too. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that <laughs> was fantastic. Calculated again. Yeah, calculated again. <laughs> And, you know, Paul and, and Robbie, Gira Paul Connors and Robbie Durazio too are still my great mentors. And, um, I talk to them regularly and I'm really grateful for the, the opportunity they gave me. And there was probably only one, you know, disappointing factor of when I left, I lost Daisy Pierce, who was my first day right. ever AFLW client wow. to the move. But I was fortunate enough that they let me take everything. And, you know, I think along your career, you can get stuck in defining yourself through different mediums and through different people. And I think, um, the, you know understanding that I, I was kind of my own identity in mm -hmm. that transition was really, really cool. And 
the business is three years in May and I couldn't be proud of what we've, you know, creating and developing and yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, that's awesome. We are going to go into your management company in a bit more depth, but just for those that, that don't know and are hearing the name Paul Connors, just for, I guess, to, to share to the listeners who, who aren't aware, Paul Connors is arguably one of the biggest sporting agents and man managers in the country from an AFL and sporting perspective. That's just got a, an unbelievable bucket list of clients that you would argue that any anyone would wish to manage. So He's um he's probably yeah as you said uh, the perfect mentor for for someone in this space that's wanting to grow and and be nurtured I I would imagine yeah absolutely he was you know he manages the likes of he managed the likes of Luke Hodge you know still does Nick Nananui did Chris Jard oh, yeah. just phenomenal talent and you know the King Twins now like just really amazing talent and and they're still probably a boutique agency but yeah. he was always really supportive of what I did and and. You know, there was a time where I left where, you know, we didn't talk too much, but you know, I'd pick up the phone. He messaged me the other day. He messaged me yesterday, actually last night. And, you know, just being able to call him when I need, um, and just have him in my corner has been really, really cool and really great. But he's just, he's a big dog in terms of, you know, yeah. the contract space he's with the, the goat, men. Right? He's the goat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> with the men. He, you know, I hate that I say that cause he'll, his head will get even bigger than it is. But <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, he's just, uh, everyone wants to be managed by him cause he, he, he cares. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, as a manager, he knows that he knows the metrics, he knows how to get the right matrix for different players and he knows how to get the money and he knows the people within the industry. And right. I think that, that a happens. lot of people lose sight of, you know, connection is key, um, and understanding, some people get really jealous on how many players you manage, but if the more players you manage, you know, the more of each list and how yeah. building each list and where you're going to fit best. So, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, but I think he does a sensational job and, um, yeah, I'm very lucky to have him in my corner with his support, you know, wholeheartedly. Just to go into this space and, and more than management is, is the brand we're talking about that Alex, uh, is the founder of. Um, but you are a bit of a pioneer across the AFLW space and it's been well documented that you're one of the first. I guess, sports agents in this space to be full-time and have a, a full-time professional company operating. I mean, did you kind of see when you were at, um, working with Paul Connors that this would be a space that a market that, yeah, I want to be a part of and I want to get on as soon as possible? Yeah, I think so. I probably wanted to do the transition a year earlier than I did. Okay. Um, and I didn't because of my hesitation with the league and, and what the league was earning and, and, and the like. And I also wanted to play again. So while I was playing, I was able to hide behind Paul because mm. agents shouldn't really play in the game. So, and that was notoriously, I probably got away with it in the past two, in the first two years, yeah. given the infancy of the comp, yeah, but yeah. I definitely wouldn't be able to get away with it no, now. For sure. And that's why I blame, you know, I was, I was good enough. And you know, <laughs> no, yeah, I'm that's just right. kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would have been there, but. <laughs> yeah, probably would have won a few brown I'd just rather pioneer cool. the female yeah. sports management <laughs> space. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess it's, it's, it's something that I always was really passionate to do. But when I was at Paul's, I, I'm always notoriously someone that can't just do one thing. Mm. So when I was at Connors and just doing men's AFL, like I was like, no, no, I'm going to start bringing in female talent. And then out of that, outside of that, I wanted to start doing other sports because I knew I could lend a hand and, and, you know, increase and, and add value to yeah. people's lives outside of AFLW. So I guess that's why for more than management, we've gone into different spaces and different sports. And, and I, I love that because I think it creates a great diversity across the talent list. But, you know, I have the goal one day of not only being the best female agent in Australia, but let alone the world, I want to create the best agency that's renowned that. for, yeah, that's renowned for, you know, their care for players and their ability to get stuff done for players in the mm. way they want it to be done. So um, that's, that's my hopes and dreams for more than management. But right now we're, you know, three years, um, next month and, that's crazy. um, I've got one guy that works under me full time. And then I've got another lady in Brisbane that works for me a couple of days a week. And we transition into different sports because I've got, you know, multiple passions in different sports, but I just see so many girls getting taken advantage of from yeah. other agents too, that I, you know, I'm just like, Oh, I just, you know, I'll manage you. Don't worry about it. Like, it's all good. Like I'll get it done. How do you want it done? And and whatnot, which sounds a bit vague, but it is true. Like there's some people that just take advantage and will sign 50 players that are the bottom wage pa placed yeah, yeah. In, on each list. And they take their, you know, four to six percent and yeah. say, I'll see you in 12 months. And it's like, God, you just can't do that anymore. No. And people want to understand what value they're getting from the relationship. And, um, that's why I call the business more than management because yeah. I want to be more than just a manager. It's like a great that. name. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great yeah. name. Shout out. <laughs> um, no, but so when you were at Connor Sports, were you sort of knocking on the door saying, hey, we need to get girls as part of this because it's going to, it's going to evolve. Were you one of the people that was sort of knocking on, knocking that down? Yeah. I went and sat in Paul's office. I vividly remember it being like, Paul, this is going to be a thing. Like we need to be on the 
forefront of it. Like, yeah. um, and I remember telling him like, this is Daisy, this is the, you know, the poster girl for AFOW. We need to talk with her. We need to do this. And he's like, why? He's like, why? You tell me why? And I said, well, first of all, it's a great, um, you know, corporate social responsibility. So I tried to sell it in a real business way. To yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to look really good on the business if we start to build equality across the, you know, the list that we've got and create a great environment for both genders. And I said, well, what about, you know, um, for example, you know, Jaden Stevenson, who they managed, his sister's a really talented sports person. So I said, when you're pitching to players, it's really attractive that, you know, you're supporting the next gen. You've got the family then. So he was like, oh, yep. Okay. All good. Let's set up a meeting. And I was like, (laughs) good start. What a pitch. Yeah. yeah, What a pitch. I'm I'm in. So (laughs) then, yeah, I remember that I'd message texted Daisy and she hadn't replied. And then I was like, I was in the car one day on the way to get lunch for work, like at lunch, at lunch break. And I was like, just call. No, just call. (laughs) No, no, no. I'm not calling. (laughs) <laughs> just call. And I like pressed it and then she answered and then she came in three days later and we wow. signed her a week later. Wow. Um, and you know, I was really proud of what I did with her. We negotiated her contract with SEN, um, for two, three years yeah. and you know, a channel seven big deal. And I was really proud of her Swiss deal and NAB deal. You know, I did all of that by myself and, That's crazy. um, I was really proud of what we were able to evolve for her. And you know, she's, she's a stellar person and stellar human and still doing great things in the community. Well, as part of your, I guess, transition out of Connors and into modern management, you mentioned like you, you obviously were fortunate enough to take some of your stock that you probably were pivotal in in bringing on. And some of the names you have is just out of this world in this, in this sport. So we we mentioned a couple, Taylor Harris, Darcy Vesio, Katie Brennan. We we touched on Madison Presspackers before. I mean, you've got some of the bolters in this game, which is just awesome to see. But I mean, how, for you, how, how did you, how did you get so much talent. I mean, do you identify the players? Do you have an eye for, for talent? Like what is it that sort of makes you? I think that during like my five years off footy, I went and um, coached under 18s, Vic Country and Vic Metro. And I, you know, I met a lot of players through there. So I met Matty Press Barkas. I met Izzy Huntington. I met Catherine Smith. I met all these great players. So when I was going to pitch for them, I already knew them and I already mm. knew the family. So I was right. able to sit down there and there was already an element of trust, which was really cool. Um, and being able to kind of pitch for them. I remember Isabel Huntington went pick one, um, in the fur, uh, in the second AFLW draft. And then that night I drove to Sunbury and pitched to Maddie Press Parkers. And then three days later I texted her and she's like, yeah, I'm in. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, oh, wow. So I think the evolution of it, I used my network really well and I used the people that, you know, I trusted and they trusted me to, to build that, that foundation. And I think that's in any management capacity, you've got to have trust and relationships with the family to be able to manage the talent. Mm. So I think that that evolution, obviously then, you know, Maddie Press Barkas was best friends with Georgia Patricio. So I got the introduction there and then you kind of can get in little introductions from different people, but Perfect. you've still got to pitch for them. And every, right. you know, I'm a big believer in, under promise and over deliver, but a lot of agents over promise and under deliver. It's so, a big decision for any yeah. athlete. I mean, like we, it's a massive decision because obviously there's a huge part of sport that when you get to the professional level, it it is a business Yeah, and you do need support. You need, you need knowledge and intelligence around you to help you navigate through it because you can't go through it alone. I no, mean. absolutely. And I think that's where a lot of people get blindsided by the big, a lot of families and girls particularly get blindsided by the big agencies that have heaps of male plays. And I'm like, you're not getting it. They're totally mm. different contracts and totally different leagues that you are worlds apart. Mm. Um, and the care and genuine, um, I guess the genuine care from agents that have huge mail lists, it's minimal because the money in a business sense, the money they earn from a, a girl compared to a boy, how much time are they really going to spend on that girl? Correct. So that's why I wanted to create the business because I actually had clear air to go and do what I wanted. Cause these girls deserve a manager in any sport, netball, you know, W league, um, football, rugby, whatever it is, they deserve a manager that's going to look after them like they're, 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 they're full-time athletes. Yeah. And that's where I guess my passion comes from being like, they deserve the top, top level service. And to be honest, unarrogantly, I probably provide a better service to the girls that, you know, are part-time athletes and some of the male managers do to full-time athletes. Sure. So, yeah. um, and that's, you know, and that's just something that I'm really proud of and, and something that I've built and, and something that I just think they're deserving of. Are you at a point now where you've obviously got a, a super, like starred line foundation of players that you're more selective of who you bring on. I guess there would have been a component of you want to get the best on and get as many on as, as you can to obviously promote your business. But now you're obviously in a position where you're full time. You just mentioned off air that you, you're looking to get some offices around the corner from where mm. we are now. Like, do do you now do you have sort of that scouting lens of like we're only going to be specific with who we get on board or how do you approach? I guess yeah, I, AFLW is really unique because at contract time, I reckon I get fifteen calls from girls freaking out about their contract and wanting me to do their contract. Right, and I just act. I'm 
I'm at capacity. Like I don't want to just take on talent to just clip, as you said, yeah, clip yeah. a ticket and go. Yeah. I want to take on talent that I really want to be a part of their entire journey. Yeah. And that's why I think it's always so important that you, like I manage them from a really young age. So you set the standards and set the, set the tone then. Yeah. But yeah, there's a part of me that kind of goes, I want to help everyone. And it's something that I've really spoken to the <laughs> AFLPA about being like, you need to, you know, you need to provide a service for these girls that are out of contract and, you know, on bottom tier wages that, you know, you need to help support them or help support us to support them. And how do we do that in a, in a really time effective way? And there's some girls that I've helped along the way because of, you know, I played footy with them back in the day or, or whatnot. And if the, any girls really, you know, really, you know, desperate for a contract, they'll always try and help. I'm probably a sucker that I care so much. And that's mm. probably my <laughs> biggest downfall sometimes, <laughs> but, um, I just want to see the league succeed and I want to see it do really well. And, and that's why I like my, my sh move into, you know, double year league and the soccer has been really, um, really calculated over the past two years and really selective in who I want to go for. But you know, that league, there's some agents that have got like a hundred plus players. And yeah. It's just like, they've just got them to make the buck. And it's yeah. like the girls don't even know what management is. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, really in terms of the, um, probably the polar opposites compared to AFLW and W league, there's a lot more agents in AFL than there is in W league. Yeah. That's crazy. Mm. So is it, has it been, uh, cause the expansion into other sports, you obviously come from the AFL background and, and started with the foundation of clients from the AFLW, but you do have a couple of other sports now that you've, you've crossed and entered into. Is, has that been difficult coming from an AFL background, particularly into like, for instance, uh, my, my background in soccer, as we touched on, like I know the agents in that field and that they're, they're sharks. They've been there for a while. I mean, is it competitive for you to kind of then go in and pitch yourself and say, Hey, look, I'm new to this territory, but this is what I'm looking at building. Is that tough? Yeah, it is tough. It, it definitely is. But I think that, you know, I've got three great clients. Um, and, um, at the moment, like we're looking to, to expand that, but it is tough, particularly because the introduction phase is really hard. Um, and I've got great mentors in Kath, um, Kate Gill, who's, you know, and CEO yeah. of the P, a PFA, and then Brendan Schwab, who was yep. CEO of the Players Association in FIFA. And they're two great mentors for me across it. Um, and they, you know, I always filter what girls are like and how they are. Not only in, in every single sport, I filter them through other people being like, hey, what do you think of this girl? Is she high maintenance? Is she, you know, yeah. after the influencer space? Or is she a genuine athlete? Yeah. Um, and I think I've been fortunate in that. I've, I managed Georgia Yimandel from um, the Western Sydney Wanderers. And, you know, she plays, she's a Fox Sport commentator and everything. So she knows the league really well. So when I ask her about a player, yeah. she'll be really honest and yeah. kind of go, you definitely shouldn't go after them. They're a brat. Their family's high maintenance. You'll hate it. And I'm like, sweet. <laughs> Line through Brutal it. Brutal honesty. Know? Brutal yeah. honesty. And it's great. But that's how I filter who I can go after right. and who I should go after. Um, but it is hard. Like, you know, it, there's no rules around the, the, the soccer space. No. So it's, it's sharks are like 14, 15 when, and you're like, Oh my God, why did you sign a five year deal at Melbourne victory? Yeah. And you're getting beta base wage. Yeah. Like, what have you done? Like, yeah. but yeah, I think it's an interesting space that you've just got to, like, I've really grown my network over the past two years and it's exactly what I did. I had multiple conversations with players that had managers and I just said, you know, I don't want to manage you. I'm not here to take you from your management, but I'd love to sit down with you to understand what's great in the space, but what's missing. And I, I you know, I built that over two years. So after I had the business for a year, I then went into that phase of um, looking into W League. But yeah, it's it's not something I've, I've never gone into a sport without doing my due diligence before that. Yeah. I've just recently got my cricket accreditation, so my ACA accreditation. Wow, which awesome. was a ridiculous three hour exam and <laughs> studying like bloody bulking bulk of um, notes, but uh, it was, it was a great experience to do. And, um, you know, I'm just about to get my NRL accreditation. I've just lodged that. So in terms of probably being one of the only females across the country in all those domains, I think I am one of the only ones and I'm just proud and I want to, you know, manage people that really genuinely want the right help. I want to manage great athletes that want to be in the game for long periods of time. I don't want to manage people that come in to be an athlete and then on the side, be an influencer. Yeah. You know, you can create great change across different sponsorships and everything as an athlete. And I re respect that. And I love doing that, but I don't like seeing people come in wanting to be influencers, getting all this free stuff and then going, I'm going to go play an average game on the weekend. It's yeah. like, you need to be the best athlete you can be in the time period you've got. Cause you'll regret it later. Exactly. It, it's so exciting for you. Cause it's like, you are one of the first in this space covering more, more and more sports as we've touched on, but you just feel like female sport in this country is starting to take a shift to become obviously more professional across pretty much every code where they're going to get more recognition and hopefully more balance in what they're getting from a pay perspective too. Um, but just to, in regards to one thing you, you do speak on, and I actually do want to understand a bit more around the people aspect, like when you're vetting for the, from the people point of view, what, why is that so important for you? 
when it comes to management? I think that when you're managing someone, you want to somewhat have some aligned values um, because I think if you're trying to help them make decisions in their life, you want to know who they are, how they make decisions, why they think the way they do, how they're brought up and, and why they're making the certain decisions they want to make. And, you know, some people make decisions based purely on money because they might come from a rough upbringing and they're desperate to make as much money in a short period of time because they've had, you know, had a really rough life. Mm. Other people might just want to make money to make money. But some people will just want to be the best athlete they can be and they'll take a pay cut for that. Or they right. just want to enjoy their sport. So I think it's really important to understand the person. And, and I don't think anyone is ever going to understand the person or want to spend time with the person that they don't get along with. Right. And okay. I think there's just like, a, and the synergies between that are really important. I think, you know, I, every value doesn't have to match up, but I think the people that, you know, you've got to have some values that match up and you've got to have some common ground in what you're doing mm -hmm. um, or some understanding across both parties. Because I think at the end of the day, I just want to get the best out of the athlete for the athlete's sake. I don't, I'm not going, you know, into a meeting and going, okay, I'm going to put this forward and then go, oh, hey, I make that management fee yeah, out yeah, of it. Yeah. I've never thought that way and never will. Yeah. And I think if I do start to think that way, I'd, I'd, I'd give the discipline up because yeah. I think that, 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 you know, that's a negligent aspect towards the client that when you're thinking about your outcome. Um, but yeah, I guess the, the whole like infancy of, you know, different sports across it, it's just, it's important to have some values aligned with what you're doing with that individual and how they're doing it. I think if, you know, you vet people pretty quickly and you can meet with them pretty quickly and understand what they want out of the agency, you know, mm. they, if you you manage the big dogs, like I, I, I managed a girl and she was completely, you know, the opposite way to what I was trying to achieve as a business. And, you know, we parted ways on that, on that proviso because wow. I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. I didn't want to represent a client that completely went against every aspect of what I was trying to do and achieve. Um, and I think that's really big, like, you know, big for me. You can sit back and take the money as an agent, but for me, it's, you know, values aligned. We're heading in the right direction and we're doing it together. And as a combined unit, like you, the clients that I manage and are fortunate to be part of their journeys, you know, it's a really headstrong, it's really, you know, um, progressive in terms of what we're trying to do and achieve. It's, it's bigger than sport really. Yeah. And it, and it's going to, you know, change young girls' lives that are coming through at the moment. One thing you speak of actually, just when I was sort of looking through more than management and some of the players that you had, one thing you emphasize quite a lot of what you, what you guys do for, for the girls is around brand, brand management. And I think that ties into a little bit of what you were touching on around the people aspect and stuff. But what, what does that actually mean? Uh, I guess for you as a manager, when you're thinking of like how we manage these girls' brands. Yeah, I think it's, you know, you do a lot of discovery into what they want to be known as and what the public want, they want the public to see. Um, you know, if I manage someone that's vegan and vegetarian, like why would I put them with McDonald's? For instance? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I know, yeah, there's a lot of managers sense. that do that and, and have done that. And I think, you know, as a manager, I'm not only managing the talent, but I'm also, I'm creating relationships with brands. And if that brand doesn't trust me and what, what I'm putting forward, I'm actually jeopardizing the next opportunity for the next client that comes along. Mm. So in terms of being able to put forward the right talent and, and the question before is like, why do you need to know the talent and, and all of that? You need to know the person to be able to put them forward for different opportunities in how mm. they'll cope under pressure and how they'll act and, and how they'll execute the job. So I think that brand management, you know, type thing, and it's quite loose because I think your brand evolves over time. Like Maddie Press Parkers comes into the league as, you know, the Carlton's first pick and then she wins every best and fairest and then she wins a Brownlow and, you know, everyone's like, oh, she should be post to go for everything. I'm like, whoa, chill. She's so young. Mm. Cause if you put her everywhere, she's going to feel pressure externally mm. her entire career. And it's like, let the kid play. Yeah. Ellie McKenzie this year, pick one of, of last year's draft and you know you speak to the club and you go just let her play the first year just back off her and let her play and you know she's won best first year play and she came second in the best and fairest the other you night. got just all the number one draft <laughs> picks <She's laughs> like, no, no, no. you just reeled no, up no, the, no. like the first three seasons yeah <laughs> 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 no, but just that kind of thing like you can't create like i think mm. athletes get really torn up in creating a brand and it's like you need to be a good athlete before you have a brand 100%, yeah. and you need to like let the let that the crowd should be the brand shouldn't correct it? and yeah. it is and that's what mm. i try to emphasize a fair bit. Like I'm fortunate to manage a lot of different players, but you know, I emphasize that you've got to keep being the great athlete that you are and, and speak volumes. Your, your actions on the field are going to speak much more and they're going to be a lot stronger if you, you know, trying to create a message off field. Yeah. So for, for you, with, I mean, do you see like an influx, obviously you, you have visibility at all, but the influx of opportunities now coming into this space for the girls, I mean, is it growing phenomenally? Is it, is it still sort of tailored to the top end sort of cattle or how does that sort yeah, of? Yeah, the opportunities probably, I think notoriously do get tailored to the top end, but I think I'm fortunate to probably manage a lot of that top end. Exactly. Not a lot of it, but you know, like what I think the best talent in the country is. And then, you know, if that opportunity isn't right for a Taylor Harris, then I've got, you know, the likes of Maddie Presparkas, Ali McKenzie, 
I've got, you know, the Hosking twins that are coming through that we're trying to build their brands that I can actually vet that opportunity too, if it's the right opportunity. So I think that notoriously the, you know, the correspondence comes in the door for the, the big girls, but they might conflict with the current sponsor or, you know, they don't have enough, enough cash to, to get there for that, for Taylor, Katie, Darcy, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So you actually open up opportunities for other girls and you're able to pitch other girls forward for those opportunities, which I think is really important to have a really holistic list of girls that are at the top of their game, but then the girls that are coming through through as well, through the ranks to, to be able to, you know, say, hey, Taylor might not be right for this opportunity because she has a current so conflict can, with Nike. Right. But, you know, the Hosking twins, are, you know, and telling their story and, and, and what not to pitch them in is something that not a lot of agents do. And we're notorious for, you know, banging down the AFL's door for new brand partnerships and yeah. everything. But, you know, pitching for them for a reason. Okay. Um, and that's important. That actually, one of the things I did want to mention that that, that kick Taylor Harris did obviously went caught headline news and the I mean your phone must have just been blowing up with opportunities. I can imagine that must have been a crazy time for, for you. Oh yeah, that was that was quite <laughs> nuts. I didn't have a lot of sleep. That's for yeah. sure. Uh, I think the phone calls were always like to tell her, it's all good. I've got it all sorted. Nah, you go to sleep. And it's all good. We'll chat in the morning. We get coffee, and I was just up all night. And she just laughs about that now. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, it's it's making sure you protect the client, protecting Taylor in that, and I was really big on that. Um, there was a lot of people in hurry saying, you need to do this, 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 and no, Tate, you need mm. to just go play a good football game. Like, yeah. and it's as simple as that. And then the messaging out of that, you know, we want to educate, we want to inspire, and we want to create a safe place for people to share their stories about being trolled. And, and that was the biggest thing. We want to educate the public through it. It wasn't going, let's do as much media in a short space of time and become as famous as we can. That was never the, no, you know, yeah. the, the driving force behind it. And, you know, we've been speaking to government for the past year and a half, two years to be able to get Taylor to go and do something really meaningful within, you know, primary schools and secondary schools. And, and that's only just starting to come to, sh to, to fruition now. Um, and I, you know, it, there's an element of patience within it too. And, you know, when you're in Taylor's, in Taylor's bubble and understanding that there's a lot of people that don't get that and go, mm. no, you need to, you need to do everything right now and right this second. It's like, Tay, yeah. you need to just chill. And she's really good at listening and she's really loyal. So her ability to listen and, and trust her team. Um, so like in terms of boxing, she tr really trusts her boxing coach and her promoter that books all her fights and at a, at a, at a, at a football level, she trusts her club and then she trusts me to do her management. That's and it's, amazing. it's great that she's got that trust and that security there because else she's just listening to too many people. But I think, you know, we managed that quite well. Um, we did, you know, all the PR in the best interest of her and made sure the messaging was, you know, continually the same. And then we bought a book out, you know, six months later because it was amazing. the educational part of that. Um, and really sticking to our guns, you know, there's a lot of people that said, well, let's come to a biography of her. I'm like, She's 21 years old. Mm. Like we're not doing a bloody biography. She played three years of football. Yeah. No. Yeah, crazy. Like, that's coming at the back end of her career. So. That's amazing though that that stuff's there though. Like that's totally. coming. Like it's yeah. a, what a, what a, what a big shift, yeah. you know, in. And I think there's a lot of people that saw her talent and saw the raw athleticism. Like we signed a four year deal with Nike before that kick and you know, wow. her markability before that is, you know, and after that kick is huge, so much more before that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Nike, who have been loyal from the start, have been great to deal with and, you know, great to be brand partners with across that period of time. So they've given her ample opportunity being part of, you know, international TVCs with Serena Williams and Sam Kerr. And so, you know, the opportunities people have got because they've come in early, like I'm very big at rewarding brands because of that, because yeah. you're loyal when they don't have the brand though. That's you're right. loyal when they, you know, they haven't got a hundred thousand followers. So I'm very big on that and getting girls to stay educated around the fact that these people were here from the beginning. They aren't coming now just because they see a product to be able to sell through you right now. Be loyal to the people that have been great to you at the start of your career. Yeah, that's a, that's really well put. It's like you always have the big picture in mind of, of what you want for your clients. I mean, in regards to when you're expanding into some of these other sports, because you obviously are watching other sports quite closely because it, it's, it is a big part of your business, but how much do you really need to know about the sport to be able to manage these players, to be able to go into that field? Do, do you, you don't really need to be an expert? I mean, what's your sort of view on that? Because um, I think you do need to understand the sport to some degree because, you know, if I was to send one of my players that played soccer from here to Switzerland to go play and they didn't play a game and they wasted eight months of their life not playing, it's negligent to their, their, their football, soccer, um, going forward. So I think you need to know the game and you need to know that they will play every game or play great minutes to, to increase okay. their ability as an athlete. Absolutely. I don't think you need to know the exact ins and outs. I don't think you need to be an ex player to really do that. I think you need to have some understanding of being an athlete to be mm. able to, you know, comprehensively be able to, you know, support and understand. But, um, you know, netball and 
W League and, you know, we've just gone into thoroughbred racing with jockeys at the moment and, and understanding all of that, you know, that it is important to know sport and know the ins and outs and, you know, the consequences when you don't have a good game or, or whatnot. But just understanding your talent and what they want is nearly more important than watching the sport itself. So you are you did you say you're managing jockeys as well? Yeah, we've just so, signed so, three female jockeys. Well, that's incredible. So you've got the some of the best AFLW players to some budding Matildas and W League players to jockeys now on I mean that's pretty incredible yeah. when you talk about the three year journey of like the wide And Aussie range. Diamonds and Aussie Diamonds. Oh we've my, got Emily Mannix. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, so yeah, I'm really proud of what we've been able to, you know, establish. My dad um is has been involved in horse racing his whole <laughs> life. So I think that's where the evolution of that network came from. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the jockey space is super interesting. We're trying to, you know, change the image of them being elite athletes because they are. They train bloody hard and, and they do everything they can to make weight and then race really well. It's, and, it's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. The, they put their body on the line every time they get on the back of a horse. So just being up like you know up for a challenge in a different area and providing a different service for what they don't have like at the end of the day they're their own brand they're their own you know club in itself they don't get strength conditioning dietetics they don't get media support mm. they get nothing they've got to do it all themselves so we need to we've created like a bit of a service to be able to help them with that mm. um so yeah i guess it's you know really cool to be able to span across different sports but you've got to have an interest or an understanding or you know at least a network in that space and my network in, you know, AFLW is probably the best out of all, all five sports, but yeah. you know, the ability to, you know, create the network in racing from my connections through families is there. And then soccer through my mentors is there. And then through netball, through my mentors is there too. So, uh, you know, NRL is something that we're looking in. And I had a great meeting with Peter Volandis not long ago, who's, you know, chairman of the NRL and, and his advice and his support. And that just comes from great relationships across the board. That's fantastic. So there's a huge part of what you do must just be networking and, and maintaining relationships, like the people aspect. That must be the fun part in <laughs> some love regards that. for you. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably what attracted me to the job in the beginning, yeah. just after year 12, um, that I, I love networking and I love understanding the network. Like the school I went to when I, you know, managed the rowing program, I got a buzz out of, you know, educating kids to row out from year eight to year nine, that's but awesome. I got a buzz from learning the parents, what they did and, you know, their relationship and what happened there and the families they got to meet. So I just love networking. I love understanding people's stories, people's journeys and, and yeah, it's been great to be a part of. So from a, from a growth perspective across female sport, I mean, are there any leagues across the world or specifically any industries across the world outside of Australia that you think are, are doing really well from like where female sport is at? Uh, I mean, like from particularly like the WNBA is just an example I have in my mind of like the respect and credibility that has in America and the broadcast of what it gets, you know, in comparison to the men is actually probably really good. I mean, it can always grow, but there's, there's a huge following and reason for following. I mean, do you sort of see that translating to what we can get to sport in this country at some point? Yeah, I think it's challenging because Australia is so sm small compared to America. <laughs> but when you talk about percentages of all of that, I think that, yeah, I think we can definitely get there. I think, you know, we've got to create cult like cult like followings, like, you know, the, um, the European league have with their soccer and, and whatnot. Like, I think, you know, Chelsea and, you know, Manchester United with their female team are doing really, really great things in the soccer league in America. I just think even female, you know, golf and female tennis and we're really showing things on the big stage of why females are important to have as role models for kids. Um, and it's the same for men, you know, it's important for men, you know, the boys to have great role models in, in the men's space too. But I think that, you know, we're only just hitting, we're only just starting our journey in female sport. And, you know, in the next 10 years, we'll look back and go, Phew, $15,000 contract. Like, <laughs> yeah. well, how did I ever play for that? You know, so or how did I ever manage that? So I think that, you know, we're just in the infancy of what's ahead. And I think what's ahead is quite big. There's always the, the topic around like equal pay and it's like people always discuss, you know, when or how or what, what the opportunity is. I mean, do you see that getting to a point with female sport in this country? Like, yeah, well, our best, our best female teams, um, you know, the Matildas and the, the women's cricket team. Yeah. And if that doesn't speak volumes enough, there's equal pay in those things because the men's benefit from it. Correct. And, you know, in any other sport, the men's, are, men are really protective of their salary and it's like, wait a minute, you know, the Matildas are the best, you know, soccer team we've got in the country and then the 100%. women's cricket are better than the men's and it's like well they're sharing their salary because the men are like yeah yeah we'll jump on board because they benefit from it but yeah. in AFL at the moment the women would benefit from you know being part of the men's CBA but the men are so protective of two or three thousand dollars each contract that they aren't willing to look at the bigger picture and look at how incredible that could be for sport long term. Do you reckon that's going to open up? I mean that that's going to shift? I mean I know CBAs are an absolute... <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> I hope it does. And it's, I think it's, you know, a big part that I'm going to help supporting the girls a lot more and be a bit more of an advocate in that space to help, you know, create better structures for the girls to have those discussions about yeah. CBA and, and educating the girls a little bit more on how they should go about it. Um, cause they're so passionate to, you know, get the right, you know, CBA for the girls, but 50 to 60% of the league wouldn't even understand what those girls do and the amount of meetings they have and conversations they have to make, you know, pay scales better for them. And they just go, Oh, tick the box. I just want to play. I just want the Jersey. I just want the apparel. And it's a lot bigger than that now. Mm. And you've got to do it now. If you don't do it now, it's going to be really hard to, you know, do it any other time. Yeah. It's hard. It's, it's a really pushing. I think we're starting to see a shift, but definitely getting the same standardization as males, particularly, I mean, obviously coming from the soccer background, the discussions around females in the sport and the W league, and sort of having that equal pay, that, that was going on back when I was playing, which was four or five years ago. So there was obviously, we were maybe a bit ahead of the curve there, but the Matil- you look at the Matildas now and what they do on the field, it's incredible. I mean, oh, they're yeah. so good. They're so, so good. good. And it's just, it's just like saying that, you know, it's an international game. I get that. And there's, you know, greater presence overseas, but we're seeing the Matildas now go to Europe because the W League's failing them. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to keep losing the best athlete, uh, best athletes overseas because, you know, they provide better pay, they provide better commercial opportunities and they pay, they provide a better playing environment for those yeah. players. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, f- for those, I guess, that have, have had a bit of insight into more the management and, and how you think about I mean, where, where do you plan on taking this journey? Where do, where do you see it going? I think my plans from year one to year two change and year two to year three change. So I think that I've got, you know, an understanding of where I want to take it and how I want to be, you know, invested in women's sport. But I don't want to put time brackets on things because if I do... You know, mm. things really change really rapidly. Um, you know, equal pay for Matildas came in year two and I was like, oh, I should jump. And I didn't want to jump in then because it just would look like I was after the, you right. know, the, the equal pay. I want to do it at the right periods of time. But, you know, my, as I said at the start, um, my dream is to be the best manager in the country, let alone the world for female talent. And, you know, I'm really committed to that, but doing it in the right way that isn't derived by the bottom line of profit. Mm. I want to be the best person for the job. Um, and that, again, I don't want to be, have, you know, have my business dictated by profits or losses or anything like that. It's how do I be the best person for that? And, you know, that's educating myself along the way to stay up to date with everything, but taking opportunities when they come um, and, and making sure, you, you know, in the cricket space, I haven't sent out 25 letters to girls because I just need a good list of cricketers right now. It's, you know, I'm really selective with who I, who I want to manage. And yep. I spoke to a cricketer not long ago and they're like, oh yeah, I know this player, this player and that player that you manage. Starting to be a bit more well known for how well we look after our talent is something that, you know, is going to take not a long time, but the right amount of time to, you know, make sure we get the right talent. I'm not in the in the mindset, as I said, to just manage everyone. I want to manage the right people that align with the business and, and what we do moving forward. And, you know, the, the sky's the limit for me with any sport. Man, I, th- I think just think that's absolutely awesome what you're doing. You're a pioneer in this space, as we've touched on. You're looking to expand into other sports. I mean, incredible, really, what, what you're doing. And I, I really hope to see this sort of evolve for you in the, in the way that you plan and we'll definitely keep supporting you. And obviously the AFLW, we, we love watching and a massive fans of and, and as the season wraps up we'll probably wrap this one up too but just wanted to thank you so much for coming in Alex it's no been worries absolute joy thanks Jack I appreciate having me on <laughs> no worries pleasure cheers cheers